Good morning and welcome to this uh, session. Uh, uh, dear colleagues and, and friends, I'm incredibly excited to be joining you today for this session on political and social movements. To prove it, I'm speaking to you live from Sweden, where it's currently 2.30 in the morning. Why am I so excited? Well, because in this session, we are going to hear from an amazing group of people who are all, in different ways, making positive change happen. To remind you, uh, we have just entered the third and final sub-theme of this year's PMAC, namely, making a difference, taking action on the ground. My name is Hampus Holmer, and together with session leads Diarmid Campbell Landrum and Fran Baum, we are moderating this session. For the past few years, I have been a civil servant in health and foreign policy for the government of my native country, Sweden. But even though I work as a health diplomat, I really hope the panel won't be too diplomatic. <laughs> in the panel today, we have, I believe, six distinguished colleagues. Maureen Pengeli of Fiji, coordinator of the Pacific Network on Globalization, Rita Issa of the UK, medical doctor, public health academic and activist. Roman Vega of Colombia, senior professor at the Pontifical uh, Javierian University and global coordinator of the People's Health Movement. Vivian Camacho of Bolivia, general director at the Ministry of Health. Mary Bassett of the US, former commissioner of health uh, of New York State. David Boyd of Canada, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. In the next two hours, together with you in the audience, the panelists will discuss and explore lessons from progress made at local, national and international levels through formal political processes and through social movements that are mobilizing for positive change on climate change and health and identify opportunities for action that will make a difference. Before handing it back to the room, let me be frank. This is not an easy topic. Often we know what needs to be done, but can't seem to get it done for a whole host of reasons, from political and financial interests to ignorance and psychology just to name a few. Understanding the political economy behind political gridlocks can help, but getting things done in a political environment takes patience, hard work, ingenuity, initiative, relationships, and a significant amount of luck. Here at the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, we recently concluded a two and a half year long dialogue series on healthy societies together with Wilton Park and the WHO Alliance on Health Policy and Systems Research. Focusing on the huge gap between the actual and the best possible health status of people across the world, the series brought together nearly 170 participants from over 50 countries to discuss ways to close that gap. Addressing the co-benefits between action on health and climate was one key theme. From this series emerged four overarching areas of action. First, to measure and visualize the health gap. Second, to co-create action to close that gap across sectors. Third, to incentivize and enable positive change, and fourth, to seize and nurture opportunities as they arise. But the dialogue also raised many questions. For example, concerning the benefits and challenges of engaging the private sector, and the perils of trying to impose health on other sectors. Indeed, health, what was at one point referred to as the age word. This year's PMAC is set against a gloomy backdrop, the triple planetary crisis. And yes, there are many reasons to be gloomy, 
But as we will hear today, and as we found in our Healthy Societies series, there is hope. To be able to carry on the hard work for positive change and get up at 2.30 in the morning, I think that hope uh, is crucial. So without further ado, I'm, I'm really delighted to hand it back to the room for a first round of interventions by the panelists, starting with Maureen. After that, we will have an interactive discussion. So for everyone in the audience, please get your questions and comments ready. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am technologically consistently terrible at this. Okay, here we go. In global discourse, whether political, economic, or social, the Pacific Islands are generally considered too small. In fact, if you look at our population size, sizes, the 12 independent island states, we make up probably less than 13 million people. Our smaller islands have 2,000 people. Middle range is about 50,000. My country is 900,000 people. We're too small, too far from uh, places of power. From Europe, we're about 16,000 kilometers. Too vast a region, problematic. Geographically, we are located in a space that covers a third of the land mass. It's about 160 million square kilometers of oceans. And of those of you who kind of know that in miles, it's about 60 million square miles of ocean. Too vast, too vulnerable to be considered mostly dismissed in terms of global discourse. But I'd like you all to consider a proposition. If the Anthropocene started with the splitting of the atom, which resulted in the nuclear bomb, the start of our climate nightmare and catastrophe of today, then we in the Pacific Islands, our people, our territories, our waters, have been the proving grounds for science, for health, and we are living witnesses to both these two phenomenal catastrophe, catastrophes, both the nuclear, but also the climate crisis. My name is Maureen Penduelli. I am a Fijian, born in the islands of Fiji, a Pacific Islander and a daughter of ocean continent. And I come from a long lineage of social movements that despite our place in global discourse are opposed to not small things, but are opposed to hegemonic worldviews and world orders. In fact, that's no small feat for any group of people. But for us, this is a real battle. I want to start with the power of global narratives and how powerful they are for the good of all mankind and in the name of world peace. These are powerful narratives. Between 1940s and 1990s, over 300 nuclear and thermonuclear weapons were tested in the Pacific Ocean, the ocean that is our home. To the North Pacific in the Marshall Islands, close to Hawaii, if we're not sure about geography here, um, the United States tested its weapons. Middle Pacific in a country called Kiribati, yeah, on an island called Christmas Island, the British tested the nuclear weapons. Further down south in French Polynesia, the French, and to the West Pacific in Australia, the British tested their weapons. The Pacific Ocean has a long history of being a proving ground to understand 
health impacts of radioactive fallout from atmospheric tests through ingestions. So we really understand what it means, this nexus that we're struggling with, environmental, climate, and um, the biodiversity crisis. People talk about displacement, migration today. We knew displacement, entire islands were vaporized during that period. Internal migration of people remains an ongoing uh, legacy of the nuclear tests. So this is a map of a lineage of movements which is called for a nuclear free and independent Pacific. We are now in the middle of a climate crisis. And so this week I've been listening to really big words and really big terminology, green revolution, a new green deal, right? And again, from perspectives of frontiers and on the climate crisis, we are really well aware of what it means to be living through a period of existential threat. This is not something that's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years time. In fact, our people are dealing with it and living with it. From basic things like incursion of salt in freshwater lenses, um, erosion of arable soils to plant, movement of people, density. People talk about density and never think about the Pacific as probably some of the most densest places in, in the world. So from a public health issue, all of these are really challenging right now. But we are challenged, not only that, it is quite clear that within this generation, my generation, and certainly the next generation, entire island states could disappear. These are atoll island nations that could dis disappear. And so I think the proposition that we have for such conferences is to think about what does a green revolution mean and a new green deal? Where does justice sit? Because right now the narrative remains that to transition from fossil fuels, oil and gas, we will need minerals, blue, green minerals. Where will these minerals come from? In fact, they will come from the Pacific. Car batteries are being promoted as the solution. They're not. So I think this entanglement of how do we transition safely with Pacific peoples already living through an existential crisis with a lived reality that the islands could disappear is highly problematic. This is a, a haiku by a young Cook Islander, really just to demonstrate uh, where we are in terms of a globalized system, where exploitation is the basis of growth, commodification, and consumption. You reap what you sow, land, rich land, but now mine, God mines. How do we mobilize against global narratives and imperatives of being both the saviors of things that we never did? So we go back to the power of a symbol. This is a, a painting by a Hawaiian artist, Joanna Motto. But the Nautilus is an ancient. It's the only living fossil that has seen the kinds of changes that we could never comprehend. But in indigenous worldviews, the Nautilus for us in the Pacific is quite a symbol of a protector. And our roles are now shifting to be that. Our people in Vanuatu, the Solomons in Papua New Guinea, either hung the shell as a sign of protection or they have carved the inside of the shells into the fronts of our canoes, into our prayer bowls, because this is a powerful symbol. 
a Canadian company with Australian uh, owners used this powerful symbol, which for the Greeks was used to design architecture. For Hindus was a sign of spirituality, the chambers of the Nautilus. And for mathematicians, the golden pie was developed out of this symbol, of this ancient. We took it as ours to drive our resistance and as a response to the madness of mining minerals 200 meters up to 7,000 meters below the sea. Today, we are told that we are naive, that it is impossible. And we're kind of used to it, um, being told that. But I want to challenge us to, to be more audacious. If you're accused of being crazy or irrelevant, then guess what? Be more audacious in your craziness. Because what we are confronted with is highly complex. And from the Pacific, our response is with audaciousness. Our countries are claiming back their territories in ways that the global community is still not able to grapple with. Tuvalu is uploading an entire nation's identity, culture, its genetic footprints into the metaverse in anticipation. But I want to leave you with this challenge that we are not waiting for others to save us, but we are moving forward into this highly complex world with, by being audacious. Thank you. We all know that there's limited time to act on the climate crisis, otherwise I don't think we would be here. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that unprecedented changes are needed to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. However, current pledges coming out of COP27 have us on track for 2.5 degrees. And on hearing that kind of information, it's curious to me how people respond. This is big information, difficult information. And I think that there's many responses that people can have. When you realize your boundaries have been breached, when you face up to injustice or a lack of fairness. And I think for some people that realization can be too much. You might feel anxious, dismissive, or go into denial. And I don't think that these are unusual responses in the face of such large news. But at times, you might decide that you want to do something about it. And I think that for anyone who decides to do something about it, and I think many people here have decided to do something about it, I think there's a good chance that you might be an activist. And so for me, the ingredients of an activist are basically deciding that there's something wrong with the world and wanting to change it. And this fits into some broad concept of theories of change, and I'll just do a quick sort of overview of theories of change. I'm sure that many people in this room are much more knowledgeable about theories of change than I am. But theories of change is a school of thought which states that individuals and institutions might have beliefs or assumptions about how change happens. And these beliefs might determine the organization that you choose to influence, the methods that you might deploy, and the outcomes that you want to achieve. And some people will work through insider means. They might try to influence and affect change from within political institutions. They might engage in a participatory manner, try and achieve cooperation. Often these calls are for somewhat incremental change, where demands might already be aligned with some form of political consensus. And within this, we can see advocacy, for example, and many people in this room I know are advocates. And for some people, they might choose to work from outside of political institutions. They might want to challenge institutions and their policies 
And there's a number of different reasons why you might choose to take action from outside an institution. Maybe you, you can't speak to policymakers. They're not going to listen to you because you're a child or you're, you're a disenfranchised person. You might be reluctant to engage with institutions so that you can maintain a critical and oppositional role and be able to call for more radical change. And activism generally sits more within this category. Activists might take an oppositional stance to policies. They might try to create alternatives to the dominant system, or they may be completely revolutionary, trying to fundamentally change society and its major institutions. And I became really curious about this. What is successful? What actually makes change happen? Having tried many means, both inside and outside institutions, I wanted to know what worked. And so a couple of years ago, we did a, a, a small study <laughs> um, looking at different health and climate organizations in England. And first of all, we looked, okay, where in the system are they trying, who are they trying to influence? And we saw that many were working at the very much grassroots level, trying to impact healthcare workers, frontline staff and students. Some were working through their hospital trusts, trying to impact change at the level of the Department of Health or government or in the media. And then others were working perhaps through the private sector, through universities, unions, or advocacy organizations like MEDAC. And then we looked at the kinds of approaches that they were taking. Some were trying to influence individuals, behavior change, uh, try printing double-sided. I, I, I saw that as, as, one of, <laughs> as one of the key campaign strategies of a group. Some were trying to influence purchasing and procurement, um, thinking about anesthetic gases, for example. Others were working with financial institutions, trying to get um, organizations to divest, or speaking with policymakers and uh, trying to influence wider political change. And we saw that there was this um, push and pull between taking bottom-up and top-down approaches. And generally what we found that within the climate and health space in England specifically, there was a tendency for groups to work very much within the sector and to take a bottom-up approach to change. And maybe also helpful to mention that from 2015 until when we did the study last year, um, the number of organizations went from something in its teens to over 100. So a real proliferation of groups really, really caring about this intersection. And so in 2018, many of you will remember there was a real rise in grassroots climate movements. Uh, Greta Thunberg, Fridays for Future. And one of the movements that emerged within the UK was something called Extinction Rebellion. And having been a climate activist for many years, but having done that very separately to my work as a doctor, I was super excited and got very much involved with Extinction Rebellion. And within a couple of months um, of this movement having some pretty good success, um, it really became um, the issue of climate change really moved into public consciousness in a way that it hadn't been in many years. Um, we found that politicians, were beginning to denounce Extinction Rebellion and denounce the people involved in climate activism as being uncooperative crusties or hippies um, or people that, that shouldn't be trusted. And there was a group of us who were healthcare professionals and we thought, well, no, you know, we, we understand the science. We are concerned members of society and um, there, there is validity in these arguments, there's validity in these calls that Extinction Rebellion is putting forwards. And so we came together and we formed Doctors for Extinction Rebellion, which was a group of healthcare workers more broadly, beginning to make these connections between climate change and health. And off the back of that, we saw a huge proliferation in various other um, subgroups of Extinction Rebellion, grandparents, priests, uh, lawyers, teachers, coming forwards and organizing either through their um, their professional capacity or in the position that they hold in society. And so I'm just going to show you a video of our second Extinction Rebellion, uh, Doctors for Extinction Rebellion action. I took an oath that the duty to my patients would come first. With the climate crisis, protection and safety of my patients is not coming first and therefore it's up to us as doctors to lay down a marker and say enough is enough. When you've read the science, 
you get nightmares, floods, wildfires, rising sea levels, extinction of all those animals that we rely on. In the global south, people are already living with the effects of extreme weather and climate change. I've seen it. I'm an A&E doctor. I've looked after people in some of those settings. I'm a practicing GP. I've not been involved in activism before. I've done all the usual writing letters, signing petitions and so on, but things still go on getting worse and worse. Having been a pretty lifelong conformist who doesn't really like upsetting people, this is well out of my comfort zone, but it's just something that's got to be done. There does seem to be something that will make a difference and that there is a chance of turning this thing around. I'm a mother of three. I've come here today to do something about the climate crisis with other doctors and make our voices heard. I've got three kids and they're really the reason why I'm here because when I think about their future I feel genuinely scared. They'll have a duty to them really to, to act so that when they turn around to you in 10 years and say well dad what did you do when you found out about this stuff that I, I can say well actually I tried I didn't just keep going to work and just plodding on. I'm feeling really nervous but it feels much better to be doing something about it than feeling totally powerless to make any difference at all. My baby will be 31 in 2050 and I have no idea what her future holds. When your government refuses to look after you and your children, you have to act. I've done everything that's polite, so now it's come to this. I feel I have no choice but to rebel. We're doing this because the government isn't taking action on climate change. This is our duty. This is our duty. And so a strong argument that we've been putting forwards in terms of taking non-violent direct action is that actually this fits very much within the General Medical Council's definition of good clinical practice. We want to hold life with the utmost respect and practice from a scientific evidence base. And if we weren't acting promptly in light of this threat to patient and public health, then we wouldn't be acting within our moral duty as healthcare professionals. And we also know, and especially from the communication session the other day, that broad sections of the population respond very positively to taking action on the climate crisis when it's presented through a health framing. And something which I found incredibly poignant and powerful has been seeing uh, lines of healthcare professionals, and often when we protest it is in scrubs, which is something that I initially felt quite uncomfortable about. But actually it does um, send a very strong visual message, is having lines of healthcare workers um, directly facing lines of police, these public servants who historically have worked um, together and now, um, and now in somewhat opposition. And I think that that really hit, touches people and makes people reconsider what it means to be a climate activist. And so through our group, we've had various successes, um, which have been part of a, a collaboration of movements, of grassroots movement. We've had uh, The Lancet and the British Medical Journal come out and speak in favor of doctors taking nonviolent action. We've seen hospitals and royal colleges uh, declaring climate emergencies, but most importantly, we've built community, people's belief in themselves as organizers and active participants in making change. And so where are we now? Um, so far, there has been no healthcare worker who's protested in uniform that has been uh, struck off from the General Medical Council, even those who've been arrested, and that has set a really strong precedent. We've also found that there's been no healthcare workers who've been arrested um, when in uniform who have actually ended up being sentenced. And recently, just a month ago, a judge um, stated for seven healthcare workers who are on trial, I was impressed by the integrity and rationality of their beliefs. Their evidence was highly moving. And so I think this is um, something for us to all reflect on. Ideally, we wouldn't have to use our positionality as healthcare workers to um, to have our, our, our voices heard and respected and listened to. But given that that's the world that we're currently in, how can we use um, that power and privilege that we might have uh, in service of a wider movement? Thank you. Good morning. Everybody, I'm going to talk about our experience of social change and political change in one of the most conservative countries in Latin America in the last years, 
but something new has been happening in my country that have created the possibility of introducing structural changes that we need to know and to reflect how that is possible in a country that has been in war for more than six decades in the last two centuries. So there are some objective conditions and also other subjective conditions in Colombia that has been intersecting in the context of the sanitary crisis, crisis that we live in 2020 and 2021. Colombia is a country with more than six decades of internal social and armed conflict and a growing socio-environmental struggle. A country with chronic poverty and social inequality aggravated by the neoliberal management of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at these pictures, you understand that this is not a new problem. It is a very chronic problem in my country. A lot of poverty, inequality, especially in the urban areas. Unemployment is another of the issues that we already have. And in the last years, this has been more important in the young population, especially amongst women. The problems of health inequality are also something that is difficult to challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, showed how the poorest socioeconomic stratum of the population suffered the most regarding this pandemic, not only in terms of debt access to a, a intensive care and hospitalizations, but also in access to the normal services, healthcare services in our network. One of the deepest determinants of poverty, social and health inequality, the internal war and the socio-environmental conflict has been the inequitable distribution of land ownership and the progressive dispossession of indigenous, Afro-descendant, and peasant territories. This is one of the pictures that show us how land ownership is so strongly inequitable distributed in my country. Most of the farmers have a few amount of land, but a few farmers have the majority of the land in my country. And the consequences of this has been many. One of these has been the process of Amazonian regions deforestation, a process that not only reflects the interests of small farmers, but also of businessmen in the bigger cities of my country. If you see how this happened, you can understand what is the profound struggle that has been happening in Colombia for so many decades. Now, the 2021 social uprising that happened in Colombia was a rebel mainly of workers, peasant, indigenous people, poor and unemployed young population that during a long process voluntarily migrate or were violently displaced from rural areas. If you see the city of Cali, where anyway, the PHA 5, the People Health Assembly number five is going to take place. The location where protesters concentrate were those zones of the city when unemployed was higher. And this is not a problem 
of objective condition of poverty and inequality only. The question is, what is it that in addition to the previous conditions, outrageous, the excluded and working youth, which from the national strike of November 2019 propitiated the social uprising that was experienced in the main cities of Colombia from April 2021. The neoliberal management of the pandemic was simply a catalyst for social protests that had been brewing for a long time. What outraged the excluded at working youth was the cynicism of a plutocratic elite of an oligarchy that for many years have governed the country using as a tool violence everywhere in our regions. The protests erupted against the government's neoliberal proposals for tax, health, and pension reforms, and against the measures to transfer large resources to big business, the financial sector, and the purchase of arms during the pandemic, and so on. This was the catalyst of this situation. And you can see how the struggle happened in our countries. This is a process of life and death. This is a process of multitudes around the poor neighborhoods struggling for survival. This is a process of health workers, health students struggling for transforming the commercialized and privatized healthcare system. This is a process of peace and indigenous communities struggling for land and struggling for dignity in our region. Social protesters took on a new forms of expression from the first lines, like in Chile and in other Latin American countries, to painting, festivities, and recreation to the various expressions of solidarity with those attacked by the police and by the paramilitary groups. People is struggling, also dancing and painting during the uprising in many cities of Colombia. People is struggling by reading and teaching others what to understand of this situation. But after the social uprising, social movement, leftist and democratic political parties converge into a socio-political coalition for change through electoral channels. The historical pact, or the broad front, or Frente Amplio, as we call it, became the triumphant sociopolitical force in the 2022 elections. They proposed a program of peace agreement implementation, agrarian reform, reform of the health and pension system, political reform, transition from fossil fuels to clean energy and ecosystems protection. This program was led by a former guerrilla commander, Gustavo Petro Urrego, who became, become, became the Colombian president, and a black feminist and environmentalist woman, Francia Marque, as vice president. Here is how this woman, a black woman, whose rights were denied for so many years, became the vice president of my country. So, we saw a century end, and we had to wait 20 years to reveal ourselves. But it is the beginning, guys. It is a new beginning, and what you see is the greatness of all our generations, workers, 
peasants, women, Afros, Latinos, indigenous people. This is the great Colombia. This is how changes happen in our countries. Thank you very much. Good, good morning, everyone. I will present again the same slides, but with examples. I was uh, in the main plenary session at the opening the first day, but today I want to present you this with examples. As Roman said and my colleague said, said, we are struggling for the right to health. Health is not a merchandise. Health is not a business. Health, people's People's health must remain in people's hands. That's why we uh, denounce the coalition, the collusion of the uh, corporative system, the agroindustrial system, the um, com complex phar pharmacy industrial system, the medical industrial complex system, the um, production of uh, um, ag agrochemicals, uh, they produce uh, chemical medicine, and also we have the industry of war, weapon. So they, those complexes are all together. They produce, uh, they, they poison our land, our water, our food, and they make, induce us to consume one, uh, one kind of health, industrial health, monocultural health. That's why we denounce health is as human right, not a business. And it's very necessary to reflect this, this because we have learned one monocultural view of health. I have studied in Bolivia and in Belgium. And it was one monocultural view of health. That monoculturality has been imposed to us as indigenous peoples with colonization, has been imposed to us as indigenous peoples with the robbery of our land. No, so we need to address now that monocultural view is um, a macrocultural, do, dominant macrocultural hegemonic model, which has to do with imposing one kind of uh, consumption. They, they want us to uh, dress the same, uh, eat the same, um, to uh, consume the same things because they see us a huge merchandise. Uh, sistema monocultural capitalista, monocultural capitalist system. So we need to go beyond this, beyond this, because our lives don't have any price. We have seen many people got lost during the pandemic. Uh, the first moments of the pandemics, our people, comrades, family, they went away because uh, we knew even if you have plenty of money at the bank, you couldn't get your breathing machine, you couldn't get your intensive care uh, um, service attention, even if you had money. That's why we need to address if we have universal health systems to protect our population, everyone is going to be protected, not only the ones that have money. That's why the mercantilization of health must be denounced. And we come from ancestral wisdom traditions, as my first uh, sister said. We remember our ancestral roots. That's why we are here to remember all together what we are struggling for. I come from ancestral wisdom. These people are called Kayawayas, and those are still alive since the Inca times, centuries ago. They are the healer people. They take herbs, uh, they take herbs from the sea to the mountain, to the valley, to the jungle, and they have a wonderful herbolary tradition. Until today, they are alive, and we recognize this in Bolivia. And also, we heal with our ceremonies. We heal uh, our sacred places. Ancestral medicine has to do with healing not only people, but it heals animals, it, heal, uh, it heals the same production, plant production, seed production, and it has to do with remembering that they are our brothers and sisters. That's why we say Father Song, Mother Moon, uh, our, their stars are our sisters, and also plants and animals are part of us. That's why we need to remember agroecology is part of the struggle because agroecology is part of the resistance. They, when the agro industry complex, they poison the food, they poison the seeds. We need to remember that agroecology for our people, indigenous people, food is to uh, feed our souls, to feed ourselves, to feed our energy, not only our bodies. 
So when we talk about ancestral ceremonies, we are talking about remembering that we are sacred creatures, as Mother Earth is sacred as well. So we have those ancient ceremonies to take care of life. And we need to remember, interculturality and health must remain alive because we have learned only one monocultural side of the history of the ones that come and took our territories with genocide, with violence. We need to remember again that our ancestral roots, is, our history is millenary history. And we, we, when we talk about interculturality and hate, health, we talk about um, both um, uh, medical, uh, Western, uh, modern, academic medicine uh, needs to dialogue and complement with ancestral wisdom, with ancestral ways of sea life, of sea health. And we are talking about decolonization and depatriarchalization, and we are talking about the plurinational state of Bolivia. Where do I come from? Plurinational means every nation, every indigenous nation is recognized. So we need to be recognized. And I'm talking about this because none, nobody, nobody gave uh, this as a gift. We had to struggle. Many people died. We had to struggle uh, strongly on the streets, as Roman Shah has shown in the pictures. In our region, we are struggling for life. If we don't do it by ourselves, nobody else is going to do. That's why we are talking about, again, gaining strength for farmers' people, for peasant people, because they are the ones feeding the world today. It's not the agribusiness company. Uh, the ones that are taking care of our people is peasant people. And in Bolivia, we were suffering offering the COP of November 2019, and during the COP, they wouldn't get grant us any right, nor the right to health. We wouldn't have any pill for the fever, for the pain, nothing. But what we had was our ancestral medicine. Our ancestral healers went in communities home to home in the first line, in the front line, facing uh, COVID-19, and we got amazing results. That's why uh, we need to address ancestral wisdom again to re regain this knowledge, to regain this wisdom. And I want to show you this because we are part of social, huge social movements which are taking care of seeds, the guardians of seeds, because seeds have our spirit as well. And the spirit of the seed, mother seed, Madre Semilla, it wants to feed the world. The mission of the seeds, the mission of the food, the, as, as um, my, my, my sister said, we want our land back in our indigenous territory. Land, as wa land wants us back too, because our sacred territories, because we are interconnected and we dialogue with the universe, we dialogue with the system. And it's another way of being in the world which has been denied, which has been uh, prosecuted, which was being um, um, menospreciado, which was, has been treated as, as witchcraft, which is not like that. It is ancient spirituality, which has to do with taking care of life. That's uh, We remember the cycles of the universe as part of our cycle lives. That's why we remember the prayers of our ancestors are still guiding us. In the same way, we need to address that... Um, that, that, that union, that um, the way of all together come together, um, uh, all come together all of us, because otherwise there is no possibility. Capitalism is saying you have the wealthiest people in the world that is traveling to Mars, they are making tourism to Mars, none of us is. Capitalism says you are the richest, and those, that, that richness has come from the basis of humankind. So we are the external cost. We are the external damage of capitalism because all of us are paying with our lives the polluted air, the polluted water, the polluted food. That's why capitalism is the system against of life. And we want a life take care system beyond that. We need to remember again that our lives are priceless. And we need to remember again that uh, if we unite, we will go on without injustice, without humiliation, remembering that we need to address dignity to have health. In that way, Bolivia has been struggling in different situations. Our government now is from the peasant people. Our government now comes from the bases. That's why we have suffered the COP, because we are the advocacy of Mother Earth in the world. 
That's why we need to address all together and remember that our indigenous communities are the guardians and they are suffering. And as a midwife, I dream about a new, a new world when we take care of each other, when we dream about all together that our lives are meant to flourish, our lives are meant to be beautiful. And beautiful comes when we have gratitude, when we have love, when we share. Sharing the food is the most beautiful act we can do. That's why our communities are, are struggling together, sharing what we have. And also to promote what we are doing in different, different networks, academic, doctors, peasants, uh, guardians of water, guardians of seeds, guardians of life, different networks. I belong to indigenous people's communication as well. So we are promoting this. And we don't have the resources, the media, the power, but we have our open heart. We have our heart in fire saying, please, we need to remember that we belong together. Global North and Global South must unite in order to survive. And we have learned it. Dr. Salvador Allende, he said, history is ours. It belongs to the people. Dr. Salvador Allende was also had suffered the COP in Chile. And also we had a great example. Dr. Ernesto Guevara, he said, the first illness we need to address is social injustice. Otherwise, there won't be help for anyone. That's why I'm part of the People's Health Movement. We, every five year, every five year we have our World Assembly, and this December we will have our World Assembly to remember that we belong together and we must organize and struggle together. Even though you have a great account in the bank, you have seen that that's not enough. We need to take care of each other. We need to collaborate with each other, otherwise, to, uh, there is no way to survive alone. We need to str uh, st uh, thrive and go on together. Thank you so much. I don't know if my mic is live. It is. It, it, with the ag agreement of the audience, I'm going to speak from my seat. Uh, I don't have slides. Uh, I first want to say how honored I am and humbled to uh, to be part of this panel, I'm a U.S. citizen, and uh, I'm very aware that my nation bears uh, enormous responsibility and should be able to take authority for addressing many of the issues that were uh, raised by my fellow panelists. Uh, I have served as a senior government official at both state and uh, local level. I was, until the end of last year, the health commissioner for New York State, uh, which has a population of 21 million. Uh, and before that, I was the health commissioner for New York City, uh, which has a population of something over 8 million. Uh, but I thought I would start out talking a little bit first on my general observations, having worked in public health for, gosh, 50, 40 years now, on the importance of social movements to health. Um, the, the reason that I'm a medical doctor is because of the 1960s in the United States, which for the first time gave full democratic rights to the black population of the United States. And uh, th through uh, Voting Rights Acts, the Civil Rights Act, and opened higher education uh, in a way that it never had been before to people of African descent in the United States. Not only did it do that, uh, but if we look at the data, the civil rights era had an enormous impact on health, and particularly in reducing inequities in health. Uh, the gap between the black and white premature mortality rate narrowed substantially. And in the southern states, uh, not only did it get better for people of African descent, black people, but the health of whites improved as well because of the actions taken by government in response to the movement for civil rights and voters' rights uh, were universal actions that were of benefit to the entire population. Uh, so in my working life, uh, what I've seen is that the advances of health in the population have more to do with the social context, which we've heard so eloquently from other members of the panel, uh, than with any technical advancements in the field of medicine. Uh, and that's uh, 
a really important observation when we talk about climate change and the climate crisis and the obligation that we have to treat it with the seriousness uh, that an existential crisis demands and how we can seek to make it part of every agenda. Uh, in the United States, uh, you probably are all aware the U.S. is uh, unique among wealthy countries and not having universal access to health care. There's still uh, some nearly 30 million people who lack health insurance in the United States uh, today in spite of some advances under former President Obama. Uh, but we have to begin to add to that demand, a narrow demand for universal health coverage. Uh, a broader, uh, broader awareness of the state of our planet. Um, and I, I think that this is a general observation of many movements uh, for reasons that I can't entirely understand, and maybe the audience will have something to say about it. Uh, the idea that the environment should be of concern uh, to uh, particularly black Americans uh, is one that's been treated with a certain amount of uh, dismissiveness. These are the people who love trees and animals, and they love them more than they love people. Uh, and this um, kind of um, disdain uh, for the reality that we see all around us, uh, the unprecedented droughts, unprecedented floods, unprecedented acute weather events, um, have, um, you know, has, has meant that we haven't seen the organizations that have typically taken the lead for political change um, take on the climate agenda and with the determination that is needed. Um, let me turn to say a little bit about what it meant to be a health commissioner um, in, uh, in this era. Uh, the eastern United States is experiencing faster warming than, than the rest of the country. Uh, and, and in uh, New York State, we've seen substantial warming over the last century. Everybody can see it in the weather patterns. Uh, interestingly, uh, the whole challenge of climate is given to not to the health department, uh, but to the environmental protection um, agencies. Uh, so the role of the health department has been substantially narrower. Uh, but one of the roles I think has been really important, and that's been the collection of data. Uh, and I, I, uh, I know that uh, we really don't need tons of data to see what's going on around us, but we really do need data to demonstrate the health impacts, to show the impact of, of air quality on, on uh, on respiratory illness and, and so forth. Uh, and that's been a role that health departments have played across the United States, and it's an important one to protect. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, it's extremely difficult to get people interested in committing resources for data collection and surveillance. Uh, it just isn't, you know, isn't that, I don't know, sexy, I guess is the right word. Um, additionally, the health departments are responsible for water quality. Uh, and this is something that I had direct involvement with as the New York State Health Commissioner. Because we have more rain than snow now, uh, we have more water runoff, uh, we have more organics going into water, uh, more tax toxic algal blooms uh, affecting water. And that brought the health department into direct negotiations with the Department of Agriculture. I don't need to tell you, I don't think, since New York State is a major agricultural producer, uh, particularly dairy, uh, who is the more powerful agency in the room in that case. Uh, so in the end, uh, much of the decision making, uh, final decision making on, based on recommendations uh, is made by the executive, which is why it's so important for people to exercise their franchise and ensure that they get elected officials who will take these issues seriously. New York State's made some advancements. It's announced an intention to phase out gas stoves uh, and, uh, uh, and other 
um, uh, utilities like furnaces in the coming decade. Uh, it has a goal of uh, zero emissions by 2050. If anybody feels that this is going to be fast enough, uh, you can, uh, you, we should have a round of applause for a 2050 goal. Uh, I, I don't think anyone in this, off, in this uh, audience will, will think that it's moving nearly quickly enough. In addition, government has uh, authority for over taxation. Um, legislation I've mentioned and the idea of phasing out gas stoves. Uh, it has procurement. It has the ability to shift its vehicle procurement, for example, which is something that New York City has recently announced that it will switch to on all electric fleets. Um, but the rate of, and the scale and the magnitude at which these things are happening is clearly inadequate, which is why we need social movements, uh, why we need to have uh, pressure on government uh, to ensure that action that's taken is commensurate with the demands that are currently facing us. I, I really um, uh, don't have any clear answers on, uh, for all of this. Uh, one of the things that struck me during this meeting is that perhaps we're too technical, and I think some of my panel members have touched on this, in the way in which we, you know, quickly whip out a graph showing that we're not, you know, we're not meeting the limits that have been agreed upon, uh, talking so much about numbers, uh, that we should tell more stories about how climate, the climate crisis is affecting lives. Uh, the only reason I can see for not having more alarm is that people think that there'll be a technical way out of this. And if we in medicine, and we've seen it even at this conference with prize winners who have found technical solutions to diseases that really have a social basis like diabetes, uh, we continue this mythology that we can always find a technical way out of, uh, out of the problems we face. And in this case, it's, it's clearly uh, not going to be possible. Uh, and we need to have much more fundamental uh, changes that address the fact that the principal drivers of trashing our planet is the drive for profit. And uh, until we tackle that, uh, I don't know how much a state health commissioner can do. Uh, I'll stop there. Hello from Canada. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. And it's really a tremendous honor to be following my five co-panelists, all of whom are such powerful speakers and powerful advocates. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that we're embroiled in an unprecedented planetary crisis. We've spoken of the climate emergency, the collapse of biological diversity, the pervasiveness of toxic pollution, also the water crisis, and the surge in zoonotic diseases. So I think it is important to tell stories. And I'm going to focus my comments, uh, because time is short, on air quality, air pollution, which we know kills over 7 million people every year. 90% of the world live in areas where air quality does not meet World or Health Organization standards. And those numbers are really unfathomable. So I just want to talk about one child for a minute, a child named Ella Kissy de Bra, a beautiful, vibrant British child who grew up in a very polluted part of London, England. And because of this air pollution generated by traffic, Ella developed a very severe case of asthma. And that asthma led her to be hospitalized on 27 separate occasions, each of which coincided with a rise in local air pollution. And on the 28th a severe asthma attack, doctors couldn't save Ella's life. Ella's mother, Rosamond Kissy de Bra, has started a foundation and has been campaigning vigorously for the past decade to get better legislation in the United Kingdom 
to protect people's right to breathe clean air. The, there is a bill called Ella's Law, which would recognize the right to breathe clean air in the UK. It's passed through the House of Lords and is now before the House of Commons. And this is part of a bigger global trend that I want to really share with you because I think it's exciting and I think we need hope. I think we need hope just as much as we need oxygen in the air we breathe. Last July, on July the 28th, the United Nations General Assembly recognized for the first time that everyone on earth has the right to live in a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. This historic resolution was the product of years of effort and a campaign by over 1,300 civil society organizations working together with indigenous people's organizations. The right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment includes clean air, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainable, sustainably produced food, non-toxic environments where people can live, work, learn, and play, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and a safe, livable climate. It also comes with a toolbox of procedural or participatory rights, including the right of access to information, uh, public participation in decision-making, access to justice, freedom of expression, freedom of association, and of course, non-discrimination and equality. When we turn to the challenge of air pollution and conversely, people's right to breathe clean air, which is part of the right to a healthy environment, I produced a report for the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2019 that looked at uh, the way that the right to a healthy environment, which was only just recently recognized by the UN, but is already found and has been found in the legal systems of nations for decades. So over 150 states, member states of the UN, have the right to a healthy environment in their constitutions, their legislation, or as members of regional human rights treaties. And so over the decades, courts, legislatures have articulated what states must do to respect, protect, and fulfill everyone's right to breathe clean air. Seven steps, beginning with number one, monitoring air quality and the human health impacts of pollution. Number two, assessing the sources of air pollution, a fundamental prerequisite to effective policy making. Number three, informing and engaging the public with information about the dangers of air pollution and also with air quality advisories. Number four, legislation that creates enforceable air quality standards. Number five is a national air quality plan or strategy which contains the measures that will be used to reduce air pollution and achieve those air quality standards. Number six is implement implementation and enforcement with adequate human and financial resources. And number seven is evaluation to check and make sure that progress is being made. Now, these obligations apply to all states. And what's really critical about a human rights-based approach is that for decades, Governments have treated environment, environmental policy as an afterthought to economic growth, as a set of options to be pursued. When you bring human rights law together with environmental law, then protecting clean air becomes an obligation. And so uh, in my role as special rapporteur, I've been able to support lawsuits around the world where citizens and communities have used their right to a healthy environment to hold governments accountable for clean air. Uh, give you three quick examples. The first was a case in Indonesia where a group of citizens filed a lawsuit against their own government, arguing that their constitutional right to a healthy environment was being violated by the terrible air quality in Jakarta. Two years ago, a court agreed with those citizens and ordered the Indonesian government to take action to protect air quality, protect and improve air quality. Unfortunately, the government appealed that decision. Fortunately, the Court of Appeals upheld the lower court decision. So now the government is in the process of implementing that court decision. Similarly, in South Africa, in a region called Mpumalanga, which has some of the worst air quality on earth because of coal mines and coal-fired power plants, two environmental justice organizations filed a lawsuit, again, based on their con people's constitutional right to a healthy environment, and were victorious with the court finding a violation of that right and ordering the government of South Africa to bring in new regulations to improve air quality. And the 30...
he'll come back. He froze. He will come back. He'll come back. Yes. And you have found the bed. Yeah. Hello. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I, I think it's pretty obvious um, what, what's just happened. Unfortunately, uh, we've lost the uh, connection to uh, to David in um, in full flow. Uh, so, hopefully, we'll we'll get him back in a minute to uh, to complete his intervention. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm uh, Dermot Campbell Lendrum. I'm the head of the uh, the climate change and health unit at WHO headquarters in Geneva and one of the co-organizers of this session, uh, along with uh, Fran from uh, the People's Health Movement. Um, and uh, first off, just uh, while, while I have the, uh, the mic, um, I'd just like to say how pleased we are to have been able to organize this panel in partnership with PHM and with the government of Sweden. Um, I think you'll agree with me that the interventions so far have been amazing. We have a, we're absolutely uh, delighted with the panel that we were able to, uh, to, to, uh, to put together. And I have to say that I think it's only at PMAC uh, that you'll be able to get this kind of panel in a session organized by the pub, uh, People's Health Movement, the Government of Sweden, and the World Health Organization. So I think that's a tribute to... Um, to what, to what PMAC is, uh, is all about. Um, my role here uh, also is uh, because um, we're delighted to have uh, Hampus um, from, uh, from the Swedish government as the, the moderator uh, remotely. And of course, he's done an, an amazing job in introducing uh, the panel. Um, I'm here basically as, as Hampus's uh, backup for the, uh, for the panel discussion. You can think of me as Hampus's ambassador in, in, uh, in Thailand, uh, just to be able to, we, we thought it might be easier to moderate a panel discussion uh, live from, uh, from the room, but we'll be switching back to, uh, to, to Hampus to, uh, to sum up. Um, it, I think what we'll do is whenever we can get uh, David uh, reconnected, we'll hand the virtual mic back to, uh, to him to, to complete his, uh, his intervention. Um, because I, again, I hope that you'll you'll agree that we've we've had a, a really amazing uh, range of interventions. We've gone from the the the, the, the populations absolutely at the front line of uh, of the climate crisis to frontline uh, health practitioners and also uh, activists to people in positions of uh, um, power uh, in in uh, national and, and state governments to the uh, to the the highest reaches of the uh, of the UN. And that is the kind of uh, spectrum of, of so political and social movements that we think we need to, to combat the climate crisis uh, in the interests of people's health uh, from around the world. Um, so what I'd like to do is to open up the, uh, the floor for, uh, for questions. Um, so we hope that uh, people will come to the mics um, and introduce uh, themselves and we'll, uh, we'll pass the questions over to the, uh, to the panel. Um, as people are formulating their questions, thinking what they would, what they'd like to ask, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, and it strikes me that it seems that we there is really a coherence of objectives across a wide range of agencies working uh, working on this. And speaking on behalf of, of WHO, which you know we're a, a, you can say we're a technocratic and, and bureaucratic organisation, but our mission is health for all. That is not a technocratic statement. That is not a bureaucratic statement. That's a statement with a vision. If you listen to our Secretary General talking about the climate crisis, he will say the same kinds of things that are being said in, in climate demonstrations uh, around the world. So we do have a coherence of uh, a commonality of aims across a wide uh, spectrum of actors. 
So we, ha we know we have the evidence on our side. It's the evidence is completely clear what we need to do to act on the climate crisis. We have public opinion on our side. Um, polling from around the world shows strong support for climate action, even, even in countries like the, uh, the United States. There is a strong body of, um, uh, of, of support for this. We have the economics on our side. It, it's not, not even credible anymore to claim that uh, we'll be better off uh, by not acting on the climate crisis that will save money. In fact, we make money. Um, we save, um, we make our money back very quickly by decarbonizing. We also have the most trusted voices on earth. We have strong support, I would say, from across the health community. And we know, again, uh, from across the world that the most trusted professions in the world, in second place, it's doctors. In first place, it's nurses. Uh, so we have all of those voices. We have all of those things. Why aren't we winning more? Um, what do we need to do to be more effective in, in what we do? I'll put, put that question on, on hold, but I'll, I'll come to the panel with that question and, and any others that people would like to, to raise in the audience. Um, but I'm very pleased to see we have uh, David uh, reconnected. Uh, so, yes, yeah, sorry that the, uh, the, the internet cut you off in full, throw, David, uh, full flow, David. So I'll, I'll pass back to you for the, to, to complete your intervention. Well, thank you very much, Dermot, and um, my apologies, uh, my sincere apologies. We've got a windstorm brewing up here. Like Maureen, I'm a Pacific Islander. I'm in the North Pacific on the west coast of Canada. And I was just about to give a third example of how the right to a healthy environment can be a very powerful tool in the context of air pollution. And this involves a case from Peru, where a community called La Arroya has seen generations of children poisoned by emissions from a lead smelter. That case was heard last October by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and I, I anticipate that we will get a, a very powerful judgment from that court in, in the coming months. So the right to a healthy environment has also been used, interestingly, to hold governments accountable for inadequate climate action. Last summer, there was a case in the Czech Republic where citizens used their constitutional right to a healthy environment to successfully engage in the legal process and won a court decision ordering the government of the Czech Republic to make faster, deeper em emissions cuts. So we have seen the power of human rights over centuries, right? The, the, the human rights were at the heart of the abolitionists' struggle to end slavery. Human rights have been used by women to achieve equality with men. Human rights were at the heart of the battle against apartheid in South Africa. Human rights were used by the civil rights movement in the US. They're being used effectively by the indigenous rights movement. So I think it's in some ways historically fortuitous that the United Nations has just recognized that everyone has the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment at a time when we need this right more than ever. And so the challenge for all of us, I believe, is to take those inspiring words from those UN resolutions and turn them into equally inspiring action to protect the rights of everyone to live in a healthy environment. Because the planetary environmental crisis is also a health crisis and it's a human rights crisis. Thanks very much for listening to me twice and I look forward to our Q&A session. Wonderful. Thank, thanks so much, uh, David. And it uh, sounds like even your intervention was impacted by the climate crisis, if that's a, a, a windstorm <laughs> a brewing. And thanks to everybody for your, your uh, adap adaptation to, uh, to, mm -hmm. to the changes in the program. So um, if there's nobody uh, raising questions yet from the floor, um, in fact, there is. Um, please take the mic. Thanks, Dermot. Um, hi, I'm Rhiannon from the People's Health Movement. Thanks so much for all of your um, really gorgeous presentations. Um, I have a question which is related to Dermot's question and like a specific part of it, which is that obviously at the moment we're not the only social movements attempting to build power and there's a huge rise in organizing across the far right, um, not just within countries but internationally. And I know that um, you have friends and colleagues on the panel who have spent a lot of their lives resisting um, the far right in their countries. Um, so I'm just wondering, I would love to hear your thoughts on how social movements can face this, both at the systemic level, but also at the kind of community level, bringing people like back, if that's possible, um, 
from those kind of movements. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Wonderful, thank you, Rhiannon. I think um, I think I see another question uh, at, at the back, please. Hi, um, so my name is Shri, and I come from a public health agency called Swasti. And my question is that we often see that health is a non-issue or it kind of comes at the last of a list of other issues. So how would you build a kind of a, a movement just around the health? Or is it completely impossible? Fantastic. Thank, thanks very much. So I think I'll... Uh, and uh, David. Thanks very much, uh, David Nabarro. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, commend the group, um, particularly starting with Hampus and uh, the work that you've managed to do with the initiative that you've done with Wilton Park. And, but then these amazing presentations. And a bit building on what Sri just was saying, I remember when the sustainable development agenda was being developed between 2012 and 2015, there was quite a debate as to whether health outcomes really ought to be somehow wrapped around the totality of the agenda, using the argument that health status is kind of the ultimate outcome of what happens right across all the domains of social, economic, and environmental development. And then others said, no, we've got to have a separate goal area for health, and there was a big discussion uh, took place in Botswana, and the motto was, health should be in all policies. Now, you could ask, how come health has sort of stayed separate and been treated separate and not been seen as the ultimate outcome indicator of human well-being. And I, I think, I, I don't know the answer, but I'd just like to pose a hypothesis that for some, to let health be a more interdisciplinary issue was a big threat. And so perhaps there are forces that keep putting health back into its comfort box of ministries of health and try to almost ridicule those who work for health equity and say, no, why aren't you focusing on hospitals and cure and finding ways to treat disease. And so I think that I'd like to suggest that one of the challenges that all of us face is to keep ensuring that health outcomes are truly interdisciplinary and also to keep focusing on the equity dimension of health as has been done so beautifully in this panel because there are many who would try to stop that. I don't want to say any more, it's just an, an hypothesis, but I, I believe that it's not by accident or because of the failure of the people's health movement that things have turned out as they are at the moment, but more that uh, there are perhaps many in different walks of life who would actually wish to prevent health equity being a, a dominant issue locally, nationally, and internationally. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks so much, uh, David. So I'm going to ask the panel to hold all of those questions in their heads, and I'll, we'll take one more and then come back for a round 
uh, across the panel and, and, and respond to, to any or, or all of uh, the ones that you've heard. So I think that's uh, Natalia, over yes, to you, please. Thank you so much, Diarmid. Natalia Linas, uh, Executive Director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. And this question actually is to David uh, Boyd. And I, I want to start by saying this has been a fantastic panel. David, your examples were all about citizens suing their governments, but as we have heard in this conference, the impact is being felt by the country's least responsible. Is there any opportunity that you see in the future for say a citizen of the Maldives to sue the United States or some other country? Like, Could there be a framework like the ICC or some international court of justice? Because it seems somewhat unfair for the internet, you know, obviously pollution is local, but it's also global and why are we not set up or what actions, what advocacy would be needed to shift that model so that we could have accountability uh, at the international level? Thank you. Uh, fantastic, thanks, Natalia. So, so we have questions about how do we uh, basically oppose opposing social movements, which oppose, sounds like pretty much everything that those on this panel and in this room would, uh, would stand for who have no interest in inequity, health equity, and so on. How do we oppose those? The question about getting a higher profile for health as a health issue. David's comment about um, whether it's even right and, and, and with the, suggesting that we should effectively counter the idea that we should narrow down on health as a, as a single issue and talk much more about health equity and the determinants of health. And then the, the spe specific question from uh, Natalia about how do we um, m effectively make the uh, the, the, the legal system uh, work more effectively uh, in order to uh, to counter the trends that we uh, that we're all trying to counter. I'll, if I may, I'll, I'll pass directly to uh, to David also to make sure that we don't lose you to another storm, David, and then uh, come back to the rest of the panel. Over to you. Right. Thank you very much, Dermot. And I just have one quick response to David's point, which is I think we really are strongest if we join forces across sectors and and refuse to be put into silos the environmental movement, the human rights movement, the public health movement, uh, the justice movement. I think we have to work collectively and we've seen the power of that in Colombia. We saw the power of that just recently in the elections in the Czech Republic. In terms of Natalia's question, uh, I think that we need to find creative ways to hold those uh, wealthy countries and wealthy people accountable for the fact that it is externalities of their hyper consumption that are causing these crises that disproportionately affect people in the global south. And that can be through litigation. There's a fascinating case currently underway where a Peruvian farmer is suing a German utility company for that utility company's contribution to the climate crisis. But it's not all about courts and litigation. We've seen in the, the most recent conference of the parties to the climate convention, finally the creation of a facility for loss and damages. It's an empty vessel. We need to find creative sources of financing so that that so that the polluters can be made to pay. And small island developing states have put forward two very compelling proposals, one for an air, uh, air, travel, air traffic levy, the other for a levy on maritime shipping. Both of those levies, levies would be very modest. For example, if you took a $25 per flight levy, the people who fly are predominantly the wealthiest people in the world, a levy of $25 per flight based on pre-pandemic levels of air travel, would raise $100 billion a year that could be put into that loss and damage facility. So I think we need to think not only of ways we can use the courts to hold people accountable, we need to find practical ways to implement the polluter pays principle, and we need the countries of the global north to really take responsibility for the crises they are responsible for creating. Fantastic. Thank, Thank thanks you. so much, uh, David. So I'll just go along the panel, just uh, keep it simple. I'll, I'll just go along this way. Um, I'll ask people to try and keep their uh, responses to about a, a minute, so then we'll get a chance for another, uh, another round of, uh, of questions as well. So over to you, uh, please, Vivian. Uh, so many uh, interesting questions. We need to address again that health is uh, construction, social construction of health has to do with social determination on health. It has to do with economical, political systems that uh, make people get sick or have health. That's why we need to address social justice. That's very necessary for us. Otherwise, we are talking about whatever capitalism told us a lie. Uh, they made us believe that we need to get more money, more money, more, more things, and the real treasure in our lives is health. 
healthy water, healthy food, healthy air. It's the real treasure. We won't have, uh, we won't buy one extra minute life for billions of dollars. We won't. That's why we need to address again the, 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 the this uh, anti-capitalism is a way of defending life. Uh, the patriarchalization is a way of defending life. The colonization is a way of defending life. To remember that we have been as humanity with ancestral deep roots to protect and defend life, to protect and defend Mother Earth and the Earth of the, the, the life of the next generations. That's why it's very necessary for us to remember that we are human community. We need to make it all together. And also, talking about health, I am a part of the high-level commission Almata 40 years. That's why, uh, more than 40 years ago, humanity committed to build help with this uh, multi-sectoral, intersectoral work but also with ancestral medicine. That's why we need to address this again. Health is part of the main treasure of our lives. And to build health, we need to live uh, with dignity, without violence, without racism. And we need to address this because uh, in the global south, we are being attacked by the uh, far right wings. Fascism attacked Bolivia, fascism made the cop during 2019, we were prosecuted because we were indigenous. Our women, women were spanked in the streets by fascists because they were indigenous. So we need to get back this respect, diversity of culture, the human diversity and diversity of thought makes us take care of biodiversity. Indigenous peoples are taking care of life right now. We need to gain again this dialogue with complementary wisdom between ancestral wisdom and modern science. Thank you. I think, yes, mine's live. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to speak to the move to the right that, um, that I think Rhiannon asked about. Certainly in the United States, uh, it's by no means clear that the, um, that the defeat of, of, um, of former President Trump will hold. And uh, so the, o the only solution to this is to mobilize and organize and uh, to, um, you know, try and work against the, I'm talking about the United States, the kind of defeatism that uh, keeps people from the polls when they don't think government does anything for them. Uh, but this rise of right-wing populism is a global phenomenon, um, and I think it's related to the forces uh, that you've just mentioned. Um, I also would like to say something about the notion of health in all policies. Uh, for me, working in, within government, uh, it was more effective to argue for equity in all policies. That if we take an equity lens to everything we do, we will get better health. Uh, but by turning to heads of other agencies and telling them to use health outcomes as their outcomes, uh, they felt like I was asking them to do their work. I, I was asking them to do my work, rather. Uh, so I, th I think, uh, David, it, uh, that would be what I would argue for. Uh, but I just don't believe that there's anyone who doesn't think that a health outcome is a valuable outcome. I, I think we all value our health. Uh, I, I, would hope, I would hope so. Uh, but certainly, if we were equitable in all of our policies, uh, we would get better health. It's not going well for the United States. I hope everyone in the audience is aware that the United States has had stagnating and since 2017 falling life expectancy with a huge uh, reduction in life expectancy uh, in, following the COVID pandemic, uh, particularly in minority groups. Uh, indigenous people now have a life expectancy that's matched only by Haiti in our hemisphere. Uh, so, you know, our policies aren't delivering on health, and, and I, I think that, um, that if we had more equitable policies, we, we would get better health outcomes. See? Si. Hello. There were um, very important questions, uh, so if we want to answer those questions, we need to do several seminars in order then to answer them properly. I simply would like to say three 
three things. The first is that the reflection on the kind of issue that hell is has been done by many uh, important people from, for instance, Friedrich Engels in the 19th century and Rudolf Virchow to Salvador Allende and to others who thought about the nature of health, relation, relation, doing a relationship with the kind of society that we have. Of course, uh, health is an outcome. And if it is an outcome, it's because it is related to some means. As a philosopher like Foucault could say regarding the governmentality of health. But we cannot solve the problem saying that health is the result of some means. We need to understand what kind of order, society order we have every time in every epoch. And that is a very important challenge that confront us with the kind of society that has been organized and the kind of interest behind this order in societies. And uh, this is a problem not also for the global south, it's also for the global north. And that is very clear. There is a tendency to oppose the discussion saying that what is happening in the global south is the responsibility of the global north. But I think that there are cross-cutting problems that relate to both the global north and the global south. And it is the kind of society, the kind of systems, the kind of order that we already have in contemporary times. That's the first reflection I would like to do. And the second reflection is that there is a tendency also to solve the problem of sectorial view on health by talking about intersectorial action and also about healthy policies that is the result of those intersectorial actions. But what we forgive when we analyze the problem of health from this perspective is that the driver forces that can solve or at least improve health situations every time are door forces confronted in the kind of society that we have. And this is a problem of class struggle and also a problem of gender, ethnic, and other issues related to what have put a problem for society every time. So to understand this implies the need of changing the kind of order that we have and the driving forces for those changes are these old paradigms that we cannot forget. We can change society. What we have forgotten is that it is possible yet and within that, within the capitalist framework, improving human rights, improving health policies, improving uh, interventions through uh, evidence approach, and through doing this, we can solve the problem. But in depth, structurally, the situation is more complicated than that. And uh, we, we, we need to, to remember that every time. And the last thing that we would like to say is that certainly there is not a single movement responsible for achieving health. We are the PHM, the People Health Movement, but we acknowledge that our action or the people's action for transforming health goes beyond the people movement. That is why we need to network with other social movements, with peace and movements, with indigenous movement, with 
workers and so on in order to create power relationship that allow us open spaces for transformations. That is the problem that we confront. We are proposing, for instance, to organize a people health tribunal because we believe that human rights actually are not working. A human rights, which is a dream, a valid dream for us, the result of uh, some deals among powers in our societies, however, are not working even within the health systems. If you look at, for instance, the UK health systems, which was an example for many countries in the world, it is not working anymore. It is in a very big crisis. So what, what is that happening? And we cannot forget that this, that the big powers in the today world are the big transnational corporations. And the big transnational corporations are not isolated, isolated uh, actors. They are the result of the kind of economic system that we already have. But these big national corporations are imposing their views on WHO, are imposing their views on the national states, and they are making the human rights fragile. And that's why it is failing. So we need to change the situation. We don't all, not only require norms, rules. Those norms and rules need to work. And how can we achieve that these rules and norms work? The only way is by changing power relationships at the local level, at the national level, but at the global level also. And this is the challenge of the social struggles, the political struggles. So if we uh, want to achieve a better health and to achieve equity, health equity, we need to change societies. We need to achieve fairer societies, social justice, democracy, and democracy not only at the parliamentary level, economic democracy. Uh, we need to think about that. So the challenge of changing societies is there, but not only to change societies, to achieve well-being. Indigenous communities in Latin America tell us, teach us, that we need to think in another way, to think about living well, buen vivir, and living well and well vivir means to have another relationship with nature, acknowledging that we are part of nature. So the only problem is not only to put the discussion in human beings, but also in the whole living beings, and that require to have another relationship with nature. And certainly, capitalism is not the society that can have a better relationship with nature. Um, I remember being at COP26 and being amazed by walking into the space and seeing all of these people who were working on climate change, seeing all of their name badges from around the world and then thinking, okay, if we're not winning, that really just speaks to the strength of corporate and profit-driven interests. And I think that those same interests also profit from polarization. Um, and just speaking to Rhiannon's point, 50% of Brazil voted for Bolsonaro, 50% of the US voted for Trump, 50% of the UK voted for Brexit, and yet, we can exist in a world where we never bump up against those people. I think it's really, really important to find ways to, um, to connect, actually, because um, thinking about the far right as, as a sort of amorphous behemoth is, is something that needs to be challenged. But when you're face to face with a person who might have the same um, uh, human drives that any other person might have, 
and, and might actually be acting out of fear or out of a sense of scarcity, which I think our economic system really drives. I think at that level, it's possible to begin to connect with people. And for better or worse, I have my Brazilian family who support Bolsonaro and my Lebanese family who um, are also right wing. And so it's really interesting because I'm constantly in these spaces where I'm really seeing the humanness of people who have different um, opinions to me. And so if you find yourself within those, in, within those silos, maybe it's worth thinking, okay, where do, I, where do I break out of that and connect with people on that human level? Because I think that that really needs to happen through a process of, um, you know, if, if, if we believe in abolition, if we believe that people can change, then we need to begin um, a process towards that dialogue. And also resist when necessary. <laughs> Um, okay, there were lots of questions, but maybe I would just start by um, saying that movements now, we don't have the luxury of the siloed uh, ways of actually organizing. I think the confluence today around political, academia, health, indigenous, feminist movements, young people's movements, um, we are in this space of confluence. We're coming together because what we're challenged with is much bigger than the individual. So when we, when we talk about movements, we talk about movements in that uh, diverse uh, space. So not just one monolithic, if you like. Uh, I wanted to add a little bit on wins, because I think that's really, really significant. We need to talk about wins and where hope sits. And the role of health practitioners, uh, public health workers. Um, and I want to use the example of the nuclear testing era. Um, they've been the cornerstone of how we got nuclear testing to stop effectively. Um, and I think we, in, in, in the movement from the Pacific, particularly the nuclear free independent movement, the ability to stop nuclear testing in 1997, the last test came off the back of, of health, people in the health movements, the medical professions, they backstop, researchers, academics, and so the win today is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. That's a long time coming to a win. Um, but it's a significant moment. And it, but it's also offered us lots of things. And one of the things that I was struck with when I attended the first ministerial meeting of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was the principle of do no harm. If we take that across to environmental justice, it is now quite fundamental in shaping the way we're looking at relationships with the natural world. The principle of do no harm. So I'm going to talk about a couple of legal norms that I think are quite exciting in addition to the UN resolution on the right to a clean, healthy environment that's now developing. And I, in my first in nearly, uh, initial uh, intervention, I talked about the need for a second wave of due diligence around legal a norm and norm setting that we have to apply, including human rights. And the two that I think are really, really critical at this point is rights of nature and ecocide that I think will test and make climate emergency crisis as two of the tests that we will run. The second thing is about the burden of proof. I think the question around, you know, you've got communities having to disproportionately prove consistently uh, the polluter pays principle, who, who do we hold account? And I want to just look at, in addition to the initi initiatives raised by David Boyd on small island states, the ICJ resolution being proposed by the government of Vanuatu that went to General Assembly um, at the end of last year, and a very small commission set up by both Tuvalu, Antigua, and Barbados, uh, on climate change. And then we've got a special repertoire on climate change, Dr. Ian Fry. But these are attempts at resolving global questions of justice that our countries are actually 
leading. As I said before, when we're talking about existential crisis, we are living existential crisis. If a government like Vanuatu is already preparing itself to physically disappear by virtue of rising sea levels, warming oceans, coral reefs dying, incursions of water, salt water into water tables, and moving their country into a digital space, that's forward-looking. But I want to end by saying something that the Tuvalu president says that I think is really critical for the global community to think about. He said, if you save Tuvalu, you save the world. And I think this is what we need to challenge you all to think about. We are currently working very hard to save the world because it is in the interest of the world to meet the 1.5 line. It's a red line that we are drawing on the global community. You have to meet that target because that is the only way to save yourselves also. But I want to just really talk about these kinds of initiatives. The Pacific is really, and small island developing states have been formidable in their advocacy on the global platform in really pushing both norms in terms of our stories, um, really to get the global community to pay attention. Saving us is saving yourselves. Thank you so much to the uh, panelists for, uh, for those, again, amazing interventions. I'll hand back to Hampus in just a minute to, to sum up. And Hampus was, was messaging uh, with me a couple of minutes ago saying, fantastic interventions may be difficult to, uh, to pull together. So I'm just going to give an, an, an offer to, to, uh, to Hampus. So I raised the question earlier about wins, and, and thanks for, for ending on, on wins. Because when I put that question, I was putting on the table, I'm a scientist by background, I was putting on the table the evidence, the economic evidence, the, the polling evidence, the evidence that, that uh, the health profession is the most trusted. But it's one of the things I've taken away from this conference is that evidence is fine, but we also need stories. We also need, that's what really motivates people. So in terms of pulling this together, Peter Freiburg, who is um, basically behind having this PMAC conference focusing on climate, environment, and biodiversity, we've been talking for some time. We've not yet managed a conversation without one of us quote, quote, quoting Greta Thunberg. And the quote that I wanted to finish on is that she says that you keep coming to us, the young people, asking us for hope. Why do you come to us asking us for hope? It's up to you, the older generations, to act. And when you act, then hope is everywhere. And I have a, a personal uh, reflection on this, which is that uh, a few, um, couple of months ago, I was downstairs working uh, late. Um, my son, who's 14, he's a climate striker, came down. He asked me what I was doing. Doesn't pay much interest in my work, uh, usually, and, and rightly so. I said, I'm writing a, a speech for Dr. Tedros. He's talking to a group of young people. Um, so, well, you know, you're a young person. What do you think he should say? He immediately focused on me and said, right, you need to understand this. My generation feels hopeless. Uh, we know it's bad. Uh, we know people are not taking care, of us, uh, um, taking care of it. Can you write down that he should give us some hope? And then he walked off. So that's what I wanted to, to, to end on, because it's something that, that it's the word that I've taken away from this conference. We heard it. I've heard it several times. We heard it in the cartoon at the beginning. We heard it in pre-meetings. We heard it in, in Hampus's uh, intervention uh, as well. And I think we heard it uh, at the end, the, the hope of saving Tuvalu, um, because by saving Tuvalu, we, uh, we save the rest of us. That's the, uh, the kind of target I think we need to aim for. So with that, um, I'll hand the, uh, the virtual mic back to, uh, to Hampus to sum up. Over to you, Hampus. Thank you very much, uh, my, my dear ambassador, dear Mid, um, dear colleagues. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be almost literally a fly on the wall here behind you um, uh, during the panel discussion, which I think did exactly what I had hoped for in, in my initial intervention, to provide hope, as you said. And it's not just empty hope that you've provided, but you've provided really a compelling vision for the well-being of both people and planet. We've heard that to achieve this, change is needed at many levels, but this is change which can and is happening um, through mobilization of social movements, 
through human rights and legal action, through activism and through governments taking or being compelled to taking action. We have also heard that we must avoid being too technical, that stories can be more effective than numbers, um, and the need to recognize the, uh, uh, the need for structural rather than merely technical solutions. Um, we've heard that sectors outside of the health sector heavily impact the health of people and planet, but often lack a health perspective, and that there may be those who prefer to keep things that way. And we have heard about the need for democracy at all levels, not just at the ballot box. Lastly then, to quote Vivian, our lives are meant to flourish and be beautiful. Uh, after this session and such a flourishing and beautiful panel, even in the middle of my night, at least I am feeling a bit more hopeful and energized to continue the hard work for healthier people and planet. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the uh, to the panel. Um, I think we now have a coffee break. So we, we need the revolution, we need La Lucha, but first, coffee. <laughs> and for the revolution, I would like to address a beautiful seed of humankind that has been seated in Bolivia. Uh, Dr. Ernesto Guevara said, above all, always be able to deeply feel any injustice committed against anyone anywhere in the world. It is the most beautiful quality of our revolutionary. Aprendimos a quererte desde la histórica altura donde el sol de tu bravura le puso cerco a la muerte. Aquí se queda la clara, la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Thank you so much. <laughs>